right, good morning, everyone. Man, we're glad you're here today. Happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. Man, moms are incredible. Anybody got an incredible mom? This is your cue, guys. Raise your hands. He sees you. Hi, I've got some incredible moms. Listen, I, uh, I read a, a little thing this week as I was preparing for our, the message and Mother's Day, and it's the stages of motherhood, what kids think about their parents, depending on what age they are. Uh, four years old, four-year-olds, my mom can do anything. She's superwoman, they think. And you get to eight years old, and they go, hey, my mom knows a lot. My mom knows a lot of stuff. Then you get to 12, and it starts going downhill. <laughs> my mama don't know everything. She don't know everything. Anybody got a 12-year-old who thinks that? My mom don't know everything. And then you get to 16. My mom's so embarrassing. She's so embarrassing. And then 18, that old woman, she's way out of date. She don't know anything. And then, and then it starts turning full circle again. And you've got a 25-year-old. Hey, she may know a little bit. <laughs> she, may, she may know a little bit about what she's talking about. And then you get to 35, and, and then it all changes. My mom was right about everything. <laughs> She knew everything. I don't need to make a decision without calling mom. Mom knows everything, and we know that to be true. Mom knows everything, and that's the circle of life for, for moms. Moms are incredible. We would be, we, Pastor Brandon said it, we really, we wouldn't be here without you, not just physically, but even in the area, even in just the seasons of life we're in. You have helped us to attain more and, and do more and accomplish more than many of us could ever dream uh, a parent could, and we just want to say, moms, we honor you today. Come on, can we one more time, can we honor our moms today? Yeah. For every biological mom and surrogate mom, anybody ever have a, a second mom? That, 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 that lady that you just, I mean, she was your second mom. Those women, there's moms in here who don't even have uh, physical kids of their own, but they're moms. They mother, they mother kids and have for years, and we just want to say thank you for every sacrifice and prayer and just getting people where they are, man. The world is a better place because Adam decided he didn't need to be alone. He needed a woman, and we just want to say thank you to moms. Hey, uh, we're in a series we're calling Core. If you've got your notes, you can go ahead and pull those out of your worship guide. There's a passage of Scripture I want to share with you this morning that talks about the heart really behind this series. We, we share this series every single year, and the whole purpose, the reason behind CORE is because we want to share the vision, the heart, the passion behind why cultivate church. When we planted this church, I can't tell you the amount of people that just said, why are you planting another church? There's churches everywhere. Why do you want to plant another church? And we just believe this. We have a passion, a heart to reach people. The Bible says in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. So from the very beginning, we had a strong desire from early on in this church, we had a very strong desire to help people discover what it means to live life on purpose. If you've been around here for, uh, for 10 minutes, you've seen that phrase somewhere. Discover what it means to live life on purpose. We just knew that most people are going through life day in and day out, just living life and existing without purpose or destiny in their life. And they're just making it through. And we know that God desires more. We talked about last week that Jesus said, I came to give you life and life to the fullest, abundantly, more than enough. And God wants that desire, not just for us, but for everyone. And he came to seek and save the lost. And, and then we had people say, well, why cultivate? Why do you want to call it cultivate? You know, the first four letters is cult, right? <laughs> We were told that a lot, and we even had a branding idea. We thought, we'll just bold real big, cult, and then evade real little. I got shot down on that. Uh, but why, why, why cultivate? Why do you want to name it that? Because we believe this. We believe the church is a people, not a place. We believe it's a living organism, not just a thing. We believe that if we're going to see God change the world, that we, the church... We, the people, have to be healthy, and we've got to grow, and, and God wants to grow something beautiful out of the local church, and, and for that to happen, it takes intentionality. It takes commitment. It takes, for, it, it, it takes the people of God being the hands and feet of God for people who need a God. We need to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and for that to happen, we've got to cultivate what God's doing in us and around us. So that's why we named the church that, because we knew that it's going to take some incredible intentionality for God to do something great in our city and through this church. And so we believe that God wants to do that. And we know that it just takes care. I've got a, a lawn, a, a, a yard, and in my backyard, many people wouldn't call it a yard. They would call it a patch of grass. I, I love flowers and I love gardening. And I, you might not know that about me, but I do. I love, 
I love gardening and I love taking care of my lawn. Now, people say you like taking care of your lawn because your lawn is like 10 by 10. <laughs> That's, it's not a very big spot, but I like it. And I, I've got a system in place. Every year, every spring, I know exactly what chemical to put on my lawn at exactly the right time so that weeds and crabgrass, anybody got some crabgrass in their yard? I hate crabgrass. I hate it. I go through and I'll pick it all out. and I do what it takes to make, it, make my lawn look nice. Why? Because I like it. I want it to be healthy. I want it to look good. But can I tell you that if I didn't do what it took to make it look that way and if I just thought it was going to do it on its own, all I would have is a big patch of weeds. Anybody got some weeds in their yard? Just a big patch of weeds because you haven't done what it takes to make it healthy this year. And for whatever reason, this year of all years, weeds are going crazy in people's yards. And that's the, exactly what the Bible talks about, the world and the church. It says, listen, if it's going to be healthy, if it's going to grow and be beautiful, it's going to take some intentionality. It's going to take time put in and investment placed in it to cultivate something beautiful out of it. And we believe the church is the hope of the world. And when it's, when it's operating in the God's will after God's purpose, that there is nothing more beautiful than the local church working and serving in the world around us. So that's our hope at Cultivate Church. And to do that, we really believe God's just placed some values in our church. And we think there are lots of things that are negotiable at our church. There are lots of things. We tell people, listen, listen, we're a yes church. We, we, we are open to whatever God wants to do to reach our city. And there's not, a, there's not a lot of stuff we won't accomplish that we won't try. We've said it this way. We'll try anything short of sin to reach people for Jesus. We're not afraid to try anything here at this church. But there are some things that are non-negotiable. There are some things that God has just placed inside of us that are values to us. And we believe that we filter everything we do as a church through these values. And I want to share those with you this morning. So let's pray together, and then we'll, di we'll dive into what a couple of those are. Father, we love you. God, thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for the miracle that's taken place here at Cultivate Church. Father, nearly 500 people accepting Christ over the past four years. That's a miracle. That doesn't happen. And God, we don't take it lightly and we don't take it for granted and we don't overlook it. Father, we just take a moment right now just to thank you for showing up. Holy Spirit, for touching lives. God, I thank you for every changed life represented in this house today. And Father, we already thank you for every changed life that's not even here yet. But God, you're working and you're going to use this church, God, to do something beautiful in this county, in this city, in this state, and around the world. Because you've called us to be the hope of the world. And I pray in Jesus' name, God, that we would be a church that honors you. So today, as we open up your word and we share some values that you've placed on our hearts, God, I pray that it would take root in all of us. God, that we are a people. This isn't a place that we go to. We are the church making a difference and impact in the world around us. And thank you for all that you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. We value, we value, number one, probably our biggest value at Cultivate Church is we value prayer. We value prayer. I love Jeremiah 33. He talks about what happens when we seek him. It says, this is what the Lord says. He, now listen, he wanted to make sure that we knew who it was. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it. The Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not no, what an incredible promise from God. You know, over and over and over again, all throughout Scripture, we can see, I could have showed you hundreds of texts, hundreds of verses in Scripture where it said, call on me and I will answer. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven. If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. Call to me and I will show you unsearchable things. The, the a fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It says it's powerful and effective. Verse after verse, after verse, time and time and time again, all throughout the word of God, God says, if you will talk to me, I will communicate back. I will show you things that you never dreamed possible if you will just seek me out. Often people pray, and you know, uh, Mark Batterson says this, the, uh, the circle maker, he wrote the circle maker. It's a book on prayer, an incredible pastor of an incredible church in Washington, D.C. He said, he said, the greatest tragedy, the greatest tragedy on earth is, is, is in life are prayers that go unanswered because they go unasked. Prayers that go unanswered because they go unasked. He goes on to say in his book, if you ever want to experience a miracle one day, then you're going to have to pray every day. That being said, what he's saying is, if you, won't see, if you want to see the hand of God move in your life, in your season, in your situation ever, then you've got to have a relationship with God on a daily basis. You need to be in the presence of God. Now, a lot of people have said this, what well, I've prayed so many times and never seen God answer. 
I've asked God so many times to do something, and for whatever reason, it just doesn't seem to come to pass. And I've been frustrated in my prayer. Am I the only one that's ever been there? I've been frustrated in my prayer life. I've tried, I've tried, I've asked, I've asked, and nothing seems to happen. But you know what? The Bible even addresses that. The Bible says this in James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Maybe you just want to write that down as a reference. He says, you don't have because you don't ask. And listen to what he goes on to say. He says, you're probably not asking because you've prayed a bunch and nothing's happened. That's exactly what he says. He says, but when you're praying and you don't receive, it's because your motives are wrong. That's a hard statement, isn't it? It's because your motives are wrong. In other words, you're very selfish. And it says, you're praying for your own goodwill. You're for your own benefit. And you need to begin to pray. You need to get a point in your life as believers. We need to get to a point in our lives when we pray, not because of what we can get out of it, because of what God can do in us. C.S. Lewis says, prayer doesn't always change my situation, but it always changes me. See, we need to look at prayer as an opportunity to shift us to the will of God, not, sh- not shift God's will to what our, our goal and what our, uh, our aspirations are. But often we've been taught that's what prayer is. If you need something, go to God. If you want something, go to God. Ask God, ask God, ask God, like he's a genie in a bottle. And that's never what prayer was designed for. The Bible says that seek the face of God and he will give you the desires of your heart. What does that mean? That as you begin to seek the face of God in prayer, the desires of your heart are then beginning to mold to his will. Not just he just decides to give you everything you want always. It means that as we begin to seek the face of God in prayer, he is changing consistently, daily, our desires to his. One of the greatest things in the life of Jesus, in, your, in a little blank under the first point, it says we need to check our motives. We need to check our motives. And I think one of the greatest helps in the, in the life of Jesus was he was able to check his motives. It was his prayer life. He had an incredible prayer life. Jesus, the Bible says often in the New Testament that he would get up before anyone else. The break of dawn, he would find a place, be on his own, away from people, and he would spend time in the presence of God in prayer. Did you know, uh, you can see very clearly in the New Testament that before Jesus ever made a major decision, he spent hours, days even, in prayer to the Father, choosing, uh, asking God his will, his plan for the decisions that he would make. Did you know that even Jesus, the Son of God, direct, I mean God, all God, all man, before he even called what disciples? he was going to call. He spent time in prayer to ask God who the disciples needed to be. Before they were ever called, Jesus spent time in prayer. Every decision he made in his life on this earth, Jesus filtered it through prayer, a value in his life. One of the most important times I see Jesus, was probably one of the last times he prayed on this earth, was he was able to, he was able to check his own motives. The Bible says this in Isaiah 55 and 9. He understood this truth in God's word. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Jesus understood that to the core of his being. So on the night before he died, the Bible says he was praying in the garden, and he prayed this prayer, his own motive, his own personal desire. God, if it's your will, if, if, you would, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. What's he praying? God, I don't want to die on a cross. I don't want to suffer the pain that I know it's going to take to save the sins from this world. I don't want to physically go through that. So God, if there's a way, please let this cup pass from me. But he, listen, he wasn't just praying his selfish ambition because he understood God's ways are higher. He was able to check his motives at the door. He said, but not my will, your will be done. Not my will, your will be done. Jesus understood God way is higher than my way. So it could have been a good thing. God, he could have prayed and God could have spared him from that, but then all eternity lost for the rest of the world. But Jesus chose the greater plan and greater purpose of God, that he would restore mankind back to relationship with God if he would just suffer through the season that he was suffering through. So he prayed, God, not my will, but your will be done. He checked his motives at the door, and as he checked his motives at the door, God used him to save all mankind for, uh, from, from an eternity apart from him in a place called hell. We need to know that we value prayer. Prayer is so valuable in our church. We believe in the power of prayer. We pray through everything. We've seen God do incredible things through the power of prayer here at Cultivate Church. You can look around, and most people in this room are a testimony to God showing up in prayer. Many of you don't know this, but today is a year anniversary uh, from Pastor Brandon and Jen going through, uh, beginning the in vitro fertilization process, trying to have a child. And this, this day, a year ago, Mother's Day a year ago, they had just received a no that they weren't going to be able to have a child at that particular moment. That was their first no that they received of a couple that were coming. 
And can I tell you this, that that was a hard day. That was a tough day. There was a lot of whys asked during those moments, during those seasons. God, why not? Why this? Why that? But you know what? It was, it's incredible to see people begin to check their motives at the door and say, but you know what, God? We know your plan is greater. Your ways are higher. And can I tell you this? A year to the day, she's literally a, a couple of weeks away, eight, eight or so weeks away from having their first child. And it's a miracle of God, and it's incredible to see. But can I tell you, had it happened then, it would have been awesome. We would have celebrated it, but we would have, we would have never known the God story that it's become to this day. See, we would have taken the good and, and never even thought about the great. God's ways are higher than our ways. And when we begin to check our motives at the door and say, God, I'm just going to trust you through the season, trust you through the process. I'm going to trust you through this season of, uh, of a lack in finances. I'm going to trust you through this season of, of horrible health. I'm going to trust you through this season that my marriage is struggling. God, I'm going to trust you through these. I'm praying, I'm asking, but God, not my will, your will be done. We want the great God. We want you to honor. We want to honor you through prayer. And God, we want to see you move. So not our will, but your will be done. So God, as a church, we trust the process. We value prayer above anything here at Cultivate Church. Number two, we value community. We value community. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I love that passage of Scripture. All the more. This was written a pretty long time ago to the very first people who ever saw that letter in the book of Hebrews. That was a pretty, go- pretty long time ago. And even then, he was saying, as the, all the more as the day of Christ approaches. Can I tell you, all the more in 2016, we don't need to give up community. And it's, we're in a culture and we're in a season who, uh, who doesn't see the value in community greater than any generation before us. Greater than any generation before us. M- most people don't know who their neighbors are. Most people don't know who their uh, kids' friends are at school. We don't know people. We're not connected to people. And we think in an age of social media, why has social media exploded? Because it is a great counterfeit to actual community. It's an incredible counterfeit to actual community. So people, you have 4,000 friends on Facebook or social media somewhere, but you don't really know any of them. And you think you're connected in community. Community is the greatest uh, uh, conduit of the presence of God in the local church. We believe this. Listen, check this out. 69% of people are what, are, are what we call social introverts. 60, that's nearly most of the population. Most everyone in this room would fall in line of being a social introvert, meaning this. You kind of like, like people, but you don't like, people, you don't like being around people. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of idea. Now, why do you think since, since the invention of the iPod and uh, you know, being able to have media at your phone literally 24-7 and the incredible cool earbuds that everybody gets to walk around with all day, that literally when you, walk, when you go to Walmart, 90% of the people have earbuds in their ear, phone in front, face down, don't mess with me. That's the code of I'm by myself, like I'm in my bubble, don't mess with me. So like that's most people. Why? Because we, we, we don't want to be around people. But can I tell you that is a lie of the enemy and that has drawn people away from life change more than any other thing. More than any other thing. And he tells us here in Hebrews, don't give up meeting together. The, the local church exploded and life change happened in the local church, in the, in the very first church, because they did not give up meeting together, home to home, house to house. They served meals with one another. If there was needs, they met those needs with one another. Community is what, li- what happens when the local church does what it's supposed to do. It, life change happens in the context of the community. I believe this, that Sunday mornings are great, and you, the messages on Sunday mornings, I love them. I'm, I, I love the local church and what happens in a worship experience on Sunday mornings. But if all you're getting is a Sunday morning worship experience and you're living life alone the rest of the week, you are not experiencing the power and the presence of God to any degree that you could be in your life. You need community. You need people in your life. The Bible says that this, the Bible even says God set it up this way. James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be, let's say it out loud, you may be, you may be healed. It's a pretty interesting phrase there, isn't it? That you may be healed. The Bible says God designed community to bring healing to people. Now we know this, the Bible tells us over and over again in Scripture that, that salvation and forgiveness only comes through the blood of Jesus. 
But I can tell you this, and I can promise you with every fiber in me, if you want to experience healing in your life from addiction, if you want to experience healing from sin or an issue in your life that you just need God, you need, you need your, your marriage to be restored. You need your family to be restored. You need life to happen again. You need healing in some form of your life. You will never find it outside of community. It's God's promise. The Bible says pray for one another, confess to one another so you can be healed. Life change happens in the context of community. So we value it here at Cultivate Church. We create environments through small groups and through serving on C teams and every opportunity we can create for people to be in community with people. We, we create that and we push that forward and we're champions of that and we rally around it. Why? Because that's where life change happens. Relational, relational, what we call relational discipleship. So guys, you need somebody in your life if you're treating your wife wrong or you're treating your kids wrong or you're making decisions that don't honor God. You need somebody in your life that you can trust that says, hey man, what the heck? What are you doing? You need to make some changes. You need to make some decisions here. You're not honoring God. Women, you need some people in your life that can spur you on toward good deeds and toward honoring God. That's what the Bible says. Spur one another on. Encourage one another. Build community with one another. Help each other live a life that honors God. We need community. We value it here at Cultivate Church. Another one we value is we value grace. We value grace. Ephesians 2.8 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Isn't that a great statement? Huh? Man, we needed grace. Anybody in here think they could do it on their own? No. There's nothing we could do. There's not one thing we could ever do to deserve God's grace, God's love, relationship with Him, eternity in heaven. It has to be freely given by Him. There was no way any of us could have purchased our own salvation. But isn't it funny that we believe that in our core, but when it comes to grace towards people around us on this earth, we, we, it's, it's almost as if we forget the grace given to us by God. And we become so ungraceful. We become, we become so judgmental. We become so standoffish from people who live differently than us, that look differently than us, that act differently than us. And then all of a sudden, we become what the world has called a religious organization, a religious people who, uh, even in Scripture, pushed the world away. Why was Jesus so attractive? Because Jesus was the definition of grace. He was graceful. Listen to what Colossians 3.13 tells us. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. It's grace. It's grace. We could never attain it. We could never do anything to get it, but it was a gift given by God. So my Lord, why wouldn't we give that gift to people around us? It's grace that makes the difference. We'll forever be a house of grace. We will never be found a people meeting together on a weekend or in small groups or in the context of the local church being judgmental toward any person, any way, anyhow. We know that except for the grace of God, there goes I. We know that, man, if it wasn't for God's grace, I'd be in the same situation. No telling where I would be apart from God's grace and the same grace God gave me. I'm going to so, with no strings attached, give it to any. Anyone who desires it. See, we're not a church who's we, we, we're not a church that was ever created for the people that sit in this room. See, all the seats that sit in, that are around you that are empty. Those are the people that need God's grace the most. Those that we exist for people who need grace. We exist for people who need no strings attached kind of love. And if you if you read in the scripture, you can see over and over again where Jesus saw life change because of his grace. Not because he had, you know, you, did you know this? Did you know people no one needs to needs to be told when they're doing something wrong in their life really? Like when have you done something wrong in your life and you needed somebody to tell you? You know that was wrong. <laughs> like we know when we're we know when we're sinning. We know when stuff's going wrong. We know when we're not living right. God, the Bible says that God through the Holy Spirit will let us know those things. We, it's not the church's job to tell the world what they're doing wrong. And it's not the church's job to mandate who gets our love and who gets our grace because they may or may not act like us or look like us. It is our job to show grace unconditionally, no strings attached, so we will forever be a house of grace. We will never, ever, ever be found of a people of God not be in the hands and feet of Jesus to anyone who would ever need it. Because listen, if, if, if people deserve anything in this world, if people deserve anything in this world from us, 
It's grace. We don't deserve it from God, but if he's given it to us, they deserve it from us. We're going to be a house of grace. Another thing that we value here at the church is generosity. We value generosity. The Bible says this. Listen to what it says about the early church. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Listen, we made it uh, known very early on as a church that we will be known as a people who give, not a people who take. The local church over the years, have been, they've really gained a reputation of taking. They've gained a reputation of being, uh, of give this, give this, give this, and God might do this, might do this, might do this. But can I tell you this? Listen, the essence of the gospel is generosity. God so loved the world that he gave, and we believe that the church isn't a place, it's a people. It's not an organization that I go to or a club that I belong to. I am the church. We are the church, and if we're going to be the church, then we are going to be generous. We're going to be generous. We believe this with all of our hearts. So as a church, we're going to be a generous church. Over the past couple of years, we've given $56,153 to church planning and world missions. Just this year alone, we have taken on, on our own as a church, a local pastor in Mexico. We are paying his salary for a year, and we have given him every resource he needs to plant a life-giving church in his village. Why? Because they don't have a church, and they need Jesus, and we believe in generosity, so we're going to give. We're going to give. We're always going to be found giving. Just in our city alone, in Shelby County alone, we've given $33,391 to local outreach so that we can see community transformation through the power of Jesus. Why? Because we're a generous church. God was generous. We're called by God and we're going to be generous. So forever we will always give. Give it away. Give it away. Never be known as a church that takes. We will always be known as a church that gives. Why? Because generosity is the essence of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He gave. And every time God gave, It made a difference in people's lives. And every church, every time we give, every time we're generous, it makes a difference in the community around us. We will forever be a church that gives. We've partnered with, we've served our city. We've given thousands to benevolence, to families in need in our city and in our local church. We've partnered with organizations to abolish sex trafficking. We've partnered with organizations for addiction recovery ministries and we'll forever increase our generosity. We've given to organizations and partnered with every uh, organization. We want to be giving. We want to be a giving church. So we're going to partner and we're going to, we're going to partner with ministries and we're going to give to people and we're never, ever, ever going to be known as a church that takes because the essence of the gospel is generosity. Can I pray with you this morning? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Nothing funny or weird is going to happen. Our worship team is going to come and play some music and I just want to pray with you this morning. You may be here this morning and that may be, the, the, that may be your life. I can't tell you the amount of people I've met in my life, in my own family, who said, man, I don't want to be a part of no church. They're just a bunch of hypocrites who take your money. They're just a bunch of, all they want is your stuff. All they want is from you. Can I tell you that God never wants anything from you. He wants everything for you. Cultivate Church wants nothing from you. We want everything for you. We are a generous church. Why? Not because we're good, not because there's anything we can do to attain the grace of God, but because God has blessed us so abundantly with his grace and with his love and with his mercy. And there is a world around us. Your family needs Jesus. Our friends need Jesus. This city needs Jesus. So we will forever be a generous church so that we have an opportunity to show them Jesus. And this morning, you may have had that same experience in your life. And I want to tell you today, through the power of the Holy Spirit, He can break down that wall. You need to know that God loved you so much that thousands of years ago, before you were ever thought of on this earth, he knew you and he had a plan and a purpose for you. And his desire is to spend eternity with you. He doesn't want anything from you. He wants to change your life today and he wants to change your eternity today. The Bible says that he, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. The Bible says it's this simple. If you believe in your heart that Jesus died on a cross and you confess your sins to him and and you believe that he came back to life three days later, the Bible says you will be saved. He will change your life 
Meaning this, he'll take every sin, every failure, every shame, every hurt, every doubt, every fear. He takes it all. And the Bible says he throws it as far as the east is from the west. Never to bring it up again because he is full of grace. He loves you today. Pastor Brandon talked to you about a connect card. There's a connect card in your worship guide. I just want to encourage everybody, take that connect card out. And in that connect card, there's a couple spots that you can check. What I'd like to tell you about is what it, the, the, the box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ. Greatest decision you could ever make in your life this morning is to give your life to Christ. Commit your life to Him. Give Him authority over your life. Make Him your Lord and your Savior. And I promise you, He'll do. He'll take you places you never dreamed possible. He's able to do abundantly more you ever thought or asked, dreamed of or imagined. Because it's His grace, it's His mercy, it's His love that changes all of us. He wants to spend eternity with you today. Maybe you're here today and you need to recommit your life to Christ. You need to give it back to Him. Mark that on your card. We would love to send you some information in the mail this week on some next steps in your walk with Jesus. So Father, today we love you and we celebrate the work you're doing in this church. And Father, I pray that the values that you've placed in this church, you would place in, that you've placed in this team and you've placed as people come, God, as people uh, join and people become owners and partners in this ministry and in this church, God, that they would be infused with the values that you've placed on us of prayer and generosity and, and love and community. God, that you give influence to this church and we gain influence in this city. God, that we make a difference in the city. We see community transformation through the power of Jesus and we see people discover what it means to live life on purpose. So we pray that for every person in this room. There are people making decisions right now to make you Lord of their life. God, as they sit in their seats, I pray, God, that you would just bring to their mind, bring to their attention, God, the, the work you're wanting to do in their lives, the sin that they need to lay at the foot of the cross. And God, we just confess there's nothing good in us apart from you, Jesus. And we just lay it all down to you today. We confess that we need you. We've tried it on our own. We need relationship with you. And we pray that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would place us in community, that we would receive forgiveness and we would see healing in our life and we would gain influence in our family. God, that our kids, it's not just for me, but for my whole family, my children would come to know Jesus. My spouse would come to know Jesus. God, that we would see the value of living a life on purpose as a family. And God, we could see life change in our city and in our families because God, it's all about you. Jesus, use us for your glory. God, we thank you for all the things you've done and are going to do. And we celebrate the good God who has a good plan in our life. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church. Can we celebrate Jesus today? Give him our best.